So, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear friends, brave friends, for being with us at this late afternoon hour. Thank you so much. We are coming to the last uh, panel, which uh, has um, a very interesting title, I must say, and uh, that is Connectivity. We heard something about it uh, in the previous panels. Connectivity, infrastructure, the ever-growing need for new investments. And uh, we are really very happy to have with us in this panel some uh, very distinguished speakers, very knowledgeable, who will uh, share their experience and wisdom with you uh, for the next uh, one hour, perhaps, more or less. And then we will have the opportunity to uh, ask any questions that you might have or any from uh, the people following us uh, uh, on, uh, on the internet. So I will be um, introducing the members of uh, the panel uh, as uh, we go along. The first, um, our first speaker, and we are very glad for having you with us, Excellency, is the ambassador of the People's Republic of China to Athens, uh, Ambassador Zhao. So thanks again for being with us, and please uh, join me here at the podium. In fact, no, don't join me. I will give it to you. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Yanis Balakakis for his kind invitation. So ladies and gentlemen, 10 years ago in 2013, China launched the Belt and Road Initiative. Since then, China has vigorously followed the principles of extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefits, making solid progress in the high quality development of the BRI. As of September this year, 149 countries and 32 international organizations had signed more than 200 cooperation agreements with China to jointly build this initiative. Interconnection means fewer barriers to mutual exchanges, more opportunities, for trade and investment, and a wider price for joint development. From 2013 to 2021, the cumulative trade in goods between China and the countries of the belt was approximately 11 trillion US dollars, with the two-way investment exceeding 230 uh, billion US dollars. In the first three quarters of this year, economic and trade exchanges became even closer, taking the, Balkan sea, uh, taking the Black Sea and the Balkans as an example. In August this year, the construction of the Palaszczuk Bridge in Croatia, a project undertaken by a Chinese consortium, was successfully completed and opened to traffic Realizing the long cherished wish of connecting the country's south and the north coasts. In July, the priority session of the Montenegro's Babojar Highway, constructed by the China Road and Bridge Corporation, was also opened. In July, the foundation was laid for construction the uh, Ivalweek wind farm in Bosnia and Herzegovina with a capacity of 84 megawatts. In March, the Belgrade uh, Novi Sad section of the, uh, of the Hungary Serbia Railway in Serbia was officially opened to traffic. So, with a maximum speed of train uh, increasing from about 45 kilometers to 200 kilometers per hour, uh, per hour. One by one, the implementation of these projects 
clearly shows that the ancient Silk Road continues to shine. It's infused with new vitality and keeps benefiting old people along its path. At its present, the joint construction of BRI has become a popular uh, global public good and an international cooperation platform in which the countries of the Balkans, the Black Sea region, the Central and Eastern European countries play a significant role. Ten years ago, China and the Central and Eastern European countries jointly established a cross-region cooperation platform, the China CEEC cooperation mechanism. Over the past 10 years, trade volume between China and the CEEC has rapidly grown by 143%, reaching 137 billion US dollars last year, with the export of agricultural products from the CEEC to China increasing by 1.5 times. Since the beginning of our cooperation, the number of Chinese tourists visiting uh, the CEC in 2019, before the pandemic, has nearly uh, quadrupled to 2.17 uh, million. Connecting China, uh, sorry, concerning the China-EU relations, I believe that dialogue, cooperation, mutual benefit, and win-win results still characterize our relations. 10 days ago, the president of the European Council, Mr. Michel, visited China. So during his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Prime Minister Li Keqiang, he stated that the EU is ready to become a reliable and predictable cooperation partner for China. China has always believed that as two main powers in the multipolar world, China and the EU have a solid foundation for cooperation since they shared a broader range of common interests. China and Europe have no strategic differences or conflicts. We support the EU's strategic autonomy and united prosperity, and we aspire to see the EU could share the opportunities from China's vast market, institutional opening up, and increasing international cooperation. Recently, uh, some politicians and the media in the West echoed the decoupling theory, advocating the reduction of dependence on China. The more complicated as it, uh, as the situation becomes, the more China and the EU should preserve their mental resilience and rationality. Europe benefits greatly from the China's rapid development. In 2021, our trade volume for the first time exceeded $800 billion US dollars, and two-way investment was over $270 billion US dollars. In the first nine months of this year, our trade volume reached 640 six billion US dollars, a year-on-year -year increase of 7.9%. The EU invested 7.5 billion US dollars in China in the first eight months, a year-on-year -year increase of 122%. So recently, the leaders of many European countries have voiced their ex expectation for deepening cooperation with China. During his visit to China, German Chancellor Schulz stated that he is willing to deepen economic and trade cooperation with China, and that Germany is ready to play its part in further developing China-EU relations. And during the recent G20 summit in Bali, Indonesia, the French president, Spanish prime minister, Dutch prime minister, and Italian prime minister expressed the willingness to strengthen the cooperation with China when they met with President, president Xi Jinping. So 
whether because of their fundamental interests or long-term plan, China and the EU should adhere to the two-way openness, uh, break down barriers, maintain the stability and smooth cooperation of the global industrial and the supply chains, promote trade and investment while facilitating the liberal, uh, liberalization and jointly lead the global post-pandemic recovery and prosperity by providing stability in a much more turbulent world. Ladies and gentlemen, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the diplomatic relations between China and Greece. <clears throat> Over the past 50 years, despite the constant changes in the international environment, China and Greece relations remained rock solid and were never shaken. Under the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative, Greece's role as a gateway for China-EU cooperation is further highlighted, and our mutually beneficial cooperation has produced fruitful results, such as the port of Piraeus, the hallmark of our win-win cooperation. Our two countries continue to deepen cooperation in fields such as the creation of regional logistic hubs and green energy transformation, positively contributing towards regional connectivity and joint development. The 20th National Congress of the CPC stressed that China will stick to its fundamental national policy of opening up firmly pursue a mutually beneficial and win-win strategy, adhere to the right path of economic globalization, and strengthen the connection between its domestic and international markets and resources so as to provide the world with new opportunities. China will steadily expand institutional opening up with regards to rules regulations, management, and standards. <clears throat> Greece emerged from the shadow of Europe debt crisis, is now accelerating its digital transformation and green development, striving to become a regional transportation hub and a logistics and energy transshipment center. So to development strategies of our two countries are highly compatible. Our economies and technologies complement one another. The potential of cooperation is great, as are its prospects. China looks forward to reaching a new consensus and join up a new blueprint for its relations with Greece, so as to enrich the China-Greece comprehensive strategic partnership and work together to build an open world economy and a new model of international relations. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Indeed, um, China for uh, thousands of years was uh, a civilization so far away, but today technology and globalization, whatever we mean by this term, has uh, really brought China so much closer to our uh, continent because it has made two factors almost irrelevant, time and distance. So this is uh, how important connectivity is among uh, even faraway states. And since we are talking about connectivity, let us talk about uh, uh, um, road connectivity, which is perhaps the most uh, important or first level of connectivity. And uh, we have uh, none less to talk about this issue than the Secretary General of the International Road Transport Union, good friend uh, Mr. Umberto De Preto, who joined IRU in, in uh, the early 90s, 95, and is uh, acting as its Secretary General from June 2013. 
led to the Italian name not fool you. Uh -huh. He is a Canadian of, uh, of Italian origin, but also very proud of his uh, Italian uh, um, uh, origin. So uh, um Umberto has another very important uh, uh, advantage, and that is he is a motorcyclist, <laughs> a passion we, say, yes, we share together. So Umberto, you have the floor. Thanks, Michael. You're going to deviate my attention if we start talking about uh, motorcycles. Uh, firstly, thank you for all of you for being here and staying to the end. And those in the front row, you do have the right to heckle since you've stayed right, right to the end. Uh, I, I do have a slide presentation. It was there, and it all of a sudden disappeared. If I could get it back, please. Yeah, but no, because that's not my presentation. There we go. That's it. That's it. Um, that's not me, I can't do that. And I will talk about digitalization and wonderful technology and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it does not. There we go, and if I could get the next slide going. Uh, ooh, that's a slow, slow-mo. Road transfer goes much more quickly than that normally. Wow, that's. <laughs> Is it yours? <laughs> That is, it is. You, you know what? Let's just stop. Stop. <laughs> stop. Stop the presentation. I'll just. I'll just speak. Um, what, what I was going to show was an old, old map of the Black Sea and Balkan region. And when I look at such an old map, it makes me think uh, of of something that happened 8,500 years ago. And I have to say this because, yes, as Michael said, I am Canadian. And and so I just like to remind people when you look at the Black Sea, it used to be the Black Sea. Black sea pre-Black Sea, it used to be a big basin. 8,500 years ago, there was global warming, and we can discuss this over dinner, otherwise I'll have the entire speech about this. Uh, and what happened is there was a giant lake underneath a massive, massive wall of ice. And 8,500 years ago, the temperature went up in a few decades, five degrees, the ice started to melt, and this massive swell of water came across, separated the UK from uh, continental Europe, continued down the Mediterranean, broke the Bosphorus Sill, and guess what? It filled up the Black Sea. So the Black Sea water is Canadian, just saying. But we, <laughs> we, we can discuss this more, more over dinner. Uh, but, but what is fundamental in all of this is, over the millennia, the Balkans and Black Sea region have been trade uh, routes, they've been crossroads. Uh, we've seen civilizations come through here. It, it was very much part of the old Silk Road. It all came through this region. Uh, and, and this is wonderful, but what is, what is clear is that roads, as Michael indicated, uh, are an important part. May, basically, you can't have intermodal transport without a beginning or end, and the beginning and the end is always road transport. At some point, you will have something in modern age uh, on a truck, and which makes it that our, our systems, our transport systems, can be more flexible, uh, more resilient in, in terms of difficulties. Uh, my next slide I would have shown uh, was a bunch of truck. No, let's, let's not try. <laughs> let's, let's really not try. I don't, I don't think, unless, unless the slides are going really fast, Oh, they are now. Oh, here we go. The next slide, which I wanted to show. Thank you very much to whoever the IT genius is. Uh, we had COVID uh, for, for long too long, and we, maybe we can discuss the impact of that afterwards. Uh, but we had the war in Ukraine. So after COVID and all the, uh, all, the, all the disruption it caused, the last thing we were expecting was we would then have a war in this region, which would then even further disrupt everything. Uh, I, what I was most proud of as Secretary General of the RU was how quickly our members responded uh, to, to the crisis and to the war. Uh, we sent immediately trucks with aid. Uh, we sent buses and coaches that helped actually move 7 million uh, refugees out of Ukraine and, and distributed them throughout Europe and, and other places. Uh, and, and this was even before uh, the UNA was able to jump in and do something. But because of this uh, war, we have now have partnerships with the UN uh, HCR uh, with the Red Cross and bringing aid and helping people get out. And we said, anytime there's another conflict, work with us directly. Give us a call. We're the guys on the road who get the, get the job done. Now, the war has also affected the entire region, whether it be because of the conflict itself, uh, because of sanctions. So trade routes have completely changed. Uh, we have to think that Ukraine was one of the main passageways to the CIS countries. And all of a sudden, you just can't go through there. So how do you get goods around? 
Greece has had a huge role to play in this in terms of absorbing the traffic. Uh, uh, Turkey, as well, just to give uh, the Turkey as a, a, an example, in, in 2022, the transit increased by 47% through Turkey, which is massive in terms of um, such, a, such an increase. Of course, what that means is, as you see here, the impact on the borders is, is tremendous. Uh, if I had an aerial view, you would have to actually see the, the real impact here. We just see a bunch of trucks together. I would have to have an aerial view or even a satellite shot to get the real impact. Uh, we did have some governments who responded uh, in, in Turkey, Bulgaria, and Georgia that said, let's increase the capacity, but it's peanuts compared to what is required in terms of the increase in volumes. Uh, we used to have and complain about uh, waiting times at certain cross border crossings. You know it extremely well, which one I'm referring to, of, of one to two days to get from one side to the other. In some parts of the BSEC region, we saw waiting times to get from one side to the other and this is not an exaggeration, 40 to 50 days, four zero hyphen to five zero days to get from one side to another. I'm sorry, we're approaching 2023. This is unacceptable. When we see that we have uh, waiting times with Ukraine at the border crossing of 40 kilometers, and that's where you need a, a shot from the sky to see what does 40 kilometers represent. Just imagine in, in your minds, uh, a place that you know that is 40 kilometers away. And imagine from this point to that 40 kilometers away, lined with trucks. And then we have the audacity within this audience and other audiences to talk about the sustainable development goals. I say to you, are you kidding me? Sustainable development in terms of economic development, you have a truck that is blocked at the border. It's not the truck that's blocked, it's the economy that's blocked. The economy is not moving. You have a driver that's held hostage in there. So how can we talk about social equity? And then in terms of environmental protection, the, the drivers have to keep the, the trucks running. Why? Because they can't lose their spot in the line. So the trucks are running, burning fuel for nothing, just to advance inches at a time. But we talk about sustainable development goals. Uh, and, and all of this, much of it because of completely unacceptable procedures. Our trucks go to the borders, and what you're hearing now is reality. I'm not talking about high level, high level stuff where the road transport guys, our feet are on the ground, we talk about what happens on the ground. Our trucks get sprayed with water claiming that it's in disinfectant. Really, like we really need disinfectant to get through a border? We do an x-ray on one side and guess what? They do an x-ray on the other side too. We have this fantastic te technology called email and digital solutions. Why don't we just exchange the pictures? The truck is weighed on one side and then weighed on the other side. Do they actually think when it goes through the border it's going to change the weight? I mean, all these ridiculous procedures that are put in place that just exacerbate the situation. Plus, add to that that we don't have secure parking areas. So when you have all these waiting times, you'd say, oh, fantastic, then our drivers can wait, wait very, very comfortably in secure parking areas. Not the case. They don't exist in most places. Some have built them. Most places have not. Uh, and add to that, the refugee crisis, where we have refugees trying to jump onto to, to the trucks, and so on and so on. And then our biggest, one of our biggest crises in the road transport industry is driver shortage, which we discussed uh, um, at, at, at the women's forum, and saying, how can we get women to come into the profession? But how can I get a woman to come into the profession when I say, you're going to wait at the border for 40 days with a whole bunch of guys, and in no secure conditions? In the EU alone, by 2026, by 2026, we will have 2 million drivers shortage. We will need 2 million drivers just to drive the economy. So, I mean, or we wake up and smell the coffee that this is the real issue that we have to address, or we'll be in huge problems. Um, with the EU, we've written to the president of the commission, uh, van der Leyen, basically saying, you have this thing called the Tier Convention, the United Nations Convention that actually helped create the European Union. After the Second World War, the IRU created it and it then became a UN convention to allow people and, 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 and countries that didn't trust each other, post-World War II, not many countries trusted each other. But with the tier system, we allowed security and therefore trade to happen with trust. We're in the same situation now with the war in Ukraine. People don't necessarily trust whatever truck and whatever the content of the truck is coming through. And so what we said is, use this tried and tested instrument, give a priority green lane for the traffic using tier, and let's stop this nonsense where we have uh, 40 kilometer queues. Give priority to tier traffic, 
you receive in advance all the pre-declaration of what we're moving, so we should be able to move this quite quickly. Another thing we need to work on is intermodality. Again, as I said at the beginning, at the beginning and the end, you'll have road transport. So let's make these links work, whether it's road rail, road uh, C, everything will start and end by road, so let's make that partnership work. Uh, what's required in this is that we have better digitalization. I'll say a few more words on that in a moment. And then we also then have priority lanes. Again, if we have containers coming from China and China is a signatory to the tier convention, let's make it a, a, a tier container so that once it arrives in the port, it can quickly get onto a truck and go to its final destination securely. What we also need is infrastructure. I normally say that we in the road transport industry appreciate every millimeter of infrastructure that's built. Uh, and we'll never complain when it is built. But what's most important are the soft procedures. I change my argument when it comes to border crossings because we are facing a situation of border crossings where we do need more infrastructure. We need to have the space for a dedicated lane. So if I'm sending you information in advance, you have a place where my truck can go and get through very quickly. But that also means that the two sides need to talk to each other, that the processes are done together, the investments are done together so that we actually speak to each other and we start doing the no-brainer solutions instead of making everything always so, so complex. Digitalization itself. Uh, we talk about the future, we talk about autonomous vehicles, they will come, I guarantee you they will come, but how can we have autonomous vehicles and we're still carrying paper? Imagine you do transport and say, oh, but wait a minute, I still have my CMR, or my bill of lading, or I have a tier carne, paper. I mean, are you kidding? It should all be digital. Uh, I once was downstairs at the RU where we had 10 million carnes stored, and I said, all the information we have in these carnes would fit on my iPhone. Why do we have all this paper? My sons look at me, who are 22 and 24, saying, why do you have so much paper? Stop, stop, use, use digital means. By doing this, we can uh, increase our processes and streamline our processes. The IRU has spent hundreds, listen to what I'm saying, hundreds of millions of dollars to implement a system whereby we can communicate to customs saying, this is who we are, this is where we're going, this is who I am, I've done this before, this is our truck number, this is my driver, everything in advance. So if there's a problem, the customers can say, please pull over, we have an issue with this. If there's no issue, let them go. And if we're thinking of the future, it must be digital. If you want security, it must be digital. And that's, that's the whole purpose of E-Tier. But we have this funny thing called ECMR. If I'm going to do a contract of carriage, you need a CMR consignment note before I even do a transport. So you want me to move something, and I'll, I'll send it to Michael. Well, we have to sign a contract where I will move the goods for you. You're here, the shipper, you're the receiver, I'm the transporter, I sign a contract. It can be digital. There's this thing called the ECMR protocol. In, let me just get these figures right. In the Balkan states, 70% of the governments have not signed, 70%, 7-0, have not signed the ECMR protocol. In the BSEC region, the majority of BSEC states have not signed the protocol. Greece has not signed the protocol. Okay? Uh, what are simple things? Sign the agreement saying I agree to the digitalization of the CMR consignment note. No, we're still waiting. And yet governments look to us and say, why don't you digitalize more quickly? Why don't you sign the document to allow us to digitalize? I mean, it's, it's, it's chicken and egg, but it's uh, ridiculous. And I'm just talking about E tier ECMR. What about E visas, E permits, E everything? Everything should be on our phone. Every transport I do should be able to have everything on my phone to be able to get it done. Uh, Turkey, we our first pilot with E tier, and I say this so you can you can hear this because it's a fantastic story. In 2016, we did an E tier pilot between Turkey and Iran. And people said, why with Iran? I said, because if we can do it between Turkey and Iran, we can do it anywhere in the world. And yet, ETIR in this part of the world, okay, isn't working. So again, how can it work with Iran? And we did it successfully in 2016, and here we're still dragging our feet. Just saying. And with that, uh, I know I've, I've taken way too long. Uh, and just to say that there are challenges. We need to rebuild, we'll need to rebuild better, but more importantly, we re need to rebuild smart. Just put our heads together. Two brains are always better than one. And imagine we get in a group like this and we can actually put our heads together. And I tell you, we can find the no-brainer solutions very, very quickly. There are low-line hanging fruits. And in everything we do, it's just a matter of common sense 
step by step, and practically speaking, we'll get it done. Sorry for the time I took. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for not heckling. Well, uh, as you very well know, Umberto, common sense is uh, a commodity in, yeah, in scarcity, to say the least. Thank you so much for your very compelling uh, speech. Um, I hope that uh, during your stay here in Athens and the meetings you will have, you will be able to solve some of these problems. I must say that during my mandate for six years as the Secretary General of BSEC, traveling around the member states, I saw, I witnessed these long queues of, of uh, poor drivers waiting for days uh, just in the middle of the road with no sanitary infrastructure, nowhere to have something to eat, and, uh, let's say, uh, having all these dangers of not only illegal immigrants, but e even, let's say, bandits falling over and, and so on. So uh, these are really um, issues of every day. They concern all of us because what eventually the trucks are transporting are the products we are producing, which we want to export, we want to bring to the, to the clients. And that's why it's very correct what you said, that a truck stuck at a border station is an impediment, it is a break to the economy of both countries. I mean, uh, the country which is produced and the country, the economy of the country that is receiving. Okay, so our next speaker is Mr. Yu Zengang. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Very correct. Thank you. <laughs> Who is uh, the chairman of the board of directors of the Costco Group. We here in Greece know the Costco Group very, very well. It has transformed the uh, port of Piraeus. Um, Mr. Yu Zengang uh, is the executive chairman of the Piraeus Port Authority from 2019. He has a vast experience in shipping industry, in corporate management, in overseas industry development, and uh, we are very much looking forward to what you have to tell us concerning not only the port of Piraeus, but about shipping in general. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear delegates and uh, guests, Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to join uh, such nice of the uh, for today. It's very honor to speak about uh, the ports of Piraeus. Uh, since uh, 2010, then uh, Costco shipping uh, started to make the cooperation and to start the ports of Piraeus. And uh, the ports of Piraeus uh, had everything uh, required to transform into a regional maritime hub and also the main gateway to Europe because of his very good strategical geography point. And also in the cross load of the three continent, which is located in the countries. So cross coast shipping on the other hand, we are the very big shipping companies in the world, and uh, whatever for the container lines, for the tank business, for LNG business, and also for bulk carrier, and uh, for the passenger ships. So we are the very uh, big uh, shipping companies in the world. So we identified the value of the port of the Pyrrhus uh, since uh, very early times. So in 2010, and uh, we are the only one in the tender to get the container terminals, especially for the PR2 and uh, PR3 uh, at that time. So during a very, because in 2010, this is a very, very difficult times of the Greek for the uh, economic uh, concession period. So from that time until now that we already uh, almost about uh, 10 to 12 years, we achieved uh, very much for this container business. Uh, I can show you that we uh, during the uh, in 2010, our container 
uh, business, our throughput is only about 800,000 800, TUs. But uh, in 2019, we already reached about 5.6 million TUs. And uh, even uh, for last year and this year, and we also reach about uh, more than 5 million TUs through port. So right now that the port of Pirios is already uh, to be the Mediterranean's and all of the Europe's top five, top fives of the uh, uh, ports. And also from the world, from the world uh, rankings and uh, uh, since 2010, we are in the Port of Pilos for the container business is in the 93, ranking in the 93, but uh, uh, right now we are in the 29th of the positions. So in fact, uh, since uh, Costco shipping began to control and uh, operate the Port of Pilos until, until today, the total uh, investment which we are doing in the port of Pirios, it already reached about 1 billion euros. And uh, leading uh, to a very huge port modernization and upgrade. So in the last years, the port of Pirios has become a symbol of the mutually beneficial and win-win corporations with the Belt and Road Initiative and concerned with the Asia, Africa and Europe. It has become one of the most important transshipment hub in the Central and the East Europe, playing a very important role in the international trade as a gateway to the Mediterranean. Concerning the Middle East, the Balkan Southern Europe and also the hinterland of the Central and Eastern Europe through land and uh, sea logistic channels, it is also the, we think that the Port of Pilos is also the closest hub, uh, hub port to the Swiss Canal, which is uh, for the main uh, mother container ships. It right now, it's almost uh, reach about 20,000 TU ships, which is uh, through the, from the Far East through the Swiss Canal to the, to the East uh, Europe. So we are, the Port of Pilos is also located in the very nearest uh, uh, distance with the Swiss Canal. So what has been exactly done that lead to the remarkable development? Firstly, uh, we think the excellent bilateral Greek-Chinese cooperation combined the best of the both worlds. Secondly, Costco Shipping, which has invested in the right directions from the beginning implementing upgrade projects on all critical port areas. It means we built the new container terminals, PR3, the logistic and also the warehousing. Also the ship repairing zone and uh, the crews and also the car and the ferry terminals, which we are undergoing on. The aim was also to enhance the port of Pilos positioning as an integrated and uh, comprehensive port, offering a completely range of the service to increasing its international comprehensive compre uh, competitiveness. Through so all the enhancement already implemented and overall extension of the capacity of the port was also achieved. But also a significant upgrade of the services provided through the digitalization and also modernization of the facilities and also infrastructure which we are undergoing on. So redevelopment projects are multi-dimensioned and, and are either implemented or currently in different uh, implementation phase. For instance, the in we, they involve the purchase and installation of the, we also, uh, built uh, to bring the one of the uh, new floating tanks, floating docks, to improve and also maintenance of the port infrastructure, so the ship the repairings. And we try to accommodate uh, all of the facilities and also upgrading of the ports of the, in the ship repairing zone. 
and try to provide it the all very good, uh, like the cranes, the pavement, the the, the dry, uh, floating docks into the ports of Piraeus in order to increasing the numbers of the ship, repair, ship repairing ships. So uh, five years before, in the ports of Piraeus, we only, the, for the ship repairing uh, ships, is almost about uh, 70 ships. But right now, we already reach about 150 ships per year to be make the ship repairing in the ports of Piraeus. So I think I also, it is uh, worth mentioning that the recently, the second part of the blood in infrastructure improvement, and also we are doing some uh, project even in the Parma ship repairing area. So we already uh, created the ports of Piraeus as uh, East Med, ship repairing hubs. And I think we were ready to create it. And right now, even sometimes we cannot uh, to let the, all of the falling ships to be bursting in the ports of Pilios to make the repairing because it's a full of the capacities. So this, I think, is uh, uh, just because we are uh, attracted the more ship owners, ship operators to be bursting in the in the ports of Pilios for the ship repairing. And uh, for the container point of view, our capacity is still, we right now we still have the total capacity right now, we already have about 7.2 million uh, TUs uh, capacity, but right now we are over uh, 5 million. So, so we still have the uh, more capacity to let the, all of the shipping companies to be uh, burst uh, as a hub for the container point of uh, view. So what is the, uh, even more important, which I, want, I have to mention, is that for the uh, passenger and also the international cruiser uh, ships, which is uh, uh, comprehensively close in the ports of Pilios. So especially uh, in this year, there are a lot of uh, cruiser, international cruiser, put uh, ports of Pilios at the, at the international hub for, for the tourist. So we almost uh, recovered the passenger ships compared during this uh, pandemic times. So this year we already reached about 700 uh, ships calling, cruiser ships calling in calling in the ports of Pilios and created about 600,000 of the passaging, which is uh, make the tools, tools on the ships and also on the, on the cities of the, of the Pilios and the cities of the uh, Athens and also the whole of the provincial of the Attica. So we think that the more and the more international cruiser a uh, operator will put the Pilios at the ports of Pilios at the home ports. So it will create the more benefit for the, all of our societies for the, in the Greek and also for all of the Attica provincial for the, for uh, the tourist. And uh, the growth of the port of Pilios, I think is very obviously it's not only in the ranking capacity and the service level, but also on the uh, actual our financial result. So in 2021, Ports of Pilios already achieved a history record in financial performance involving in all of the business uh, levels and also uh, this year, our nine months of the 2022, our profit and already exceeded our four years profit for 2021. So this year we also can create the very good uh, uh, profit for the, for the company. So we're expecting that there will be the new record high in revenue and also uh, profitabilities. And uh, of course, this uh, what is uh, more important is that we also share of this benefit 
go back to the society through our intellect or director to the coastal municipalities. And we're doing a lot of uh, uh, benefits for the coastal, we, because along our port of authority, we have the four of the city municipal, municipalities. And uh, we give them a lot of uh, uh, social responsibilities and, uh, and let all of the peoples to have the working in the port of Pilos. We almost uh, have the every day have about uh, 3,000 to 4,000 our delectable laborers to be working in the, in the ports of Pilos. And also we created uh, indirect uh, uh, employment uh, about 10,000 people working in, in, in this field. So uh, <clears throat> we creation, uh, is we have the continually contribution of our PPA to the local and the national uh, economic. Based on the uh, one of the figures which is created from the one of the university that uh, our added value for the Greek economic reaching in 2021 and estimated is about 0.76% of the total country's GDP. In addition to 0.06% of the state tax revenues. And uh, we also maintain a very, very strong pool of the about more than 1,100 supplies, supply, supplies company with the majority coming from our local uh, community. It is also to, uh, just I mentioned that we created about uh, 4,000 uh, peoples with the directly jo job and uh, working in our parts of uh, uh, periods. So, I, so close, I think uh, close, uh, very close next to making an impact to society is uh, for the PPA the constant effort towards generating a very positive impact to the environmental. As one of the country's largest company, Port of Pilos is well aware of its duty to contribute to the national, European, and global efforts towards achieving climate changing targets. The company is also aware of the even great responsibility towards protecting the environmental by reducing the environmental consequence of its own uh, activities. So one pillar involves action for the energy consumption reduction, but also for the generating of our own green energy. So I think we are uh, during these uh, two and three years, we also of our company, we hold the echo port uh, status in Greek, and also, also the list of the most uh, sustainable uh, companies in Greece in 2022. So due to the strong performance in ESG, our uh, PPA, Ports of Pilos, is also uh, already amongst the 35 listed uh, company, which uh, are included in the new ESG index launched by the Essen Stock Exchange because we are also the listed uh, uh, stock exchanging companies in the in Greek. So before closing my speech, I would like to stress the fact that all redevelopment project at the port of the Pyrrhus strengthen the connection between Greece and uh, the rest of the world. And we are sure that the Greek Greece will benefit from the all well-deserved world-class maritime hub. The, the port of Pyrrhus today is our busiest, uh, also the very busiest uh, passenger port in Europe and also very important cruiser destination and also the ship home ports. The fastest growth container ports in the world, a major log logistic center, 
and also the ship repair central in the Mediterranean. And uh, also is a very global gateways to the East Med uh, area. So this is my, what we are doing during these uh, 10 and 12 years since we, we have the involved in the operations of the Port Lyos. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yu. This was indeed a very comprehensive uh, report uh, on, uh, on um, the achievements that uh, Costco has uh, managed uh, in, uh, in the port of Piraeus, which indeed is one uh, was and is still one of the fastest growing ports worldwide. Uh, and um, this goes also hand in hand with uh, the progress of uh, the Greek shipping in general, which, as you know, is almost uh, 22 to 23 percent of the world shipping. Uh, so all of this infrastructure in connectivity needs uh, investment. So I'm very, very glad we have today with us uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Harris Lambropoulos, who is the president of the Hellenic Development Bank of Investments, um, a, a, an economist uh, who has his PhD from uh, the London School of Economics. He is also a faculty member, a professor at the University of Patras, and uh, has many <laughs> Other, oh, uh, yes, activities. other activities. I yes. won't uh, I, we will lose too much time in, in order to enumerate them. Um, he is uh, also a, a, a an, um, principal consultant of the World Bank. Uh, yeah. He was advisor to ministers uh, here in Greece of education, yeah. tourism development, health and social uh, solidarity, and so on. Most of all, we are very happy and glad to have you with us, uh, uh, Dr. Lombropoulos. Please give us the, the point of view from uh, a bank, although uh, they say that uh, you, if you want to go to a bank and ask for money, you first have to prove that you don't need the money in order for the bank to give it to you. So, <laughs> uh, Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Christidis, for the kind introduction. Indeed, uh, all these uh, activities you mentioned before about myself. They gave me the ability to have a broader view and understanding of uh, what is going on. Most of them were pro bono, actually, especially the Chamber of Commerce uh, activities and the startup incubator uh, activities. These are a give back to, to the society we all owe to. Uh, however, I will uh, disappoint yourself, first of all, and the audience, because I'm not a bank. I'm not representing a bank per se. I'm representing the sovereign fund of funds of Greece, which is the Hellenic Development Bank of Investments. So we are purely a, an equity provider, an equity investor, meaning that we take uh, the risk along with the businesses in uh, on behalf of the Greek state, yes, uh, in investing in the equity of uh, the uh, various projects to be implemented. So HDBI, Hellenic Development Bank of Investments, is the sovereign fund of funds of Greece. Uh, our activity is to manage state and EU funds on behalf of the Greek state, to procure and invest them along with other private investors, uh, in new venture capital and private equity funds, uh, although we can do also direct investments in uh, projects. Uh, the Hellenic Development Bank of Investment uh, kick-started uh, uh, um, uh, as uh, TANEO, as New Economy Fund 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, uh, and uh, helped uh, to uh, established the venture capital ecosystem in Greece. Uh, then we had uh, the Jeremy and Equifund funds. All these together, the past 20 years, uh, the uh, state deployed about 370 uh, million euro to 
uh, help the uh, Greek equity ecosystem. Uh, our two mottos, uh, which uh, summarize uh, our vision and what uh, we want to do, is uh, we invest for growth and uh, we finance innovation. Uh, to, today, we uh, have uh, under management 2.1 billion uh, euro, uh, which, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, will be invested on behalf uh, 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 from our behalf uh, for the Greek state in uh, uh, equity uh, investments. Uh, this can give a multiplier of three and a half to four percent, four times uh, in uh, real economy uh, projects. We have uh, eight open calls uh, uh, at uh, the moment um, to uh, ad address to uh, fund managers. Uh, that they come and express interest to us. We do not invest in existing funds. Uh, we don't do backward due diligence. We invest in human capital, in the potential of the fund managers to look ahead, to have a solid strategy, a solid investment strategy, uh, to be invested in the Greek economy or in projects having a Greek angle. Um, also, we are uh, the equity platform instrument of uh, the uh, so-called National uh, uh, Resilience and Recovery Plan of Greece, Greece 2.0, uh, and we are the anchor investors on behalf of the Greek state of the Festos 5G uh, fund to be invested in uh, uh, 5G technologies and infrastructure. So I don't want to uh, say more, but uh, uh, as a, a summary, our target, our aim is to act as the ambassador and further support the Greek and venture capital ecosystem for the benefit of the small and medium enterprises uh, in Greece and uh, also for uh, startups. Uh, now, I said all that. Uh, however, uh, what is important to, to mention is that uh, equity is uh, the key to unlock uh, all the rest of uh, uh, financing and uh, funding uh, in any economy. Uh, having this uh, uh, availability of funds as the sovereign fund of funds, uh, what we say is that in the coming five to seven years, Greece is going to uh, uh, welcome, is going to uh, receive about 80 billion euro from uh, European structural funds and European uh, financing like the Resilience and Recovery Facility. So in order to deploy all this uh, financing in the real economy, it, it is needed private financing. Among the private financing is equity. Therefore, equity will be the key to unleash all this 80 billion in the near future. So any investor coming to Greece, uh, Costco is a landmark example, as uh, President uh, and Ambassador explained uh, earlier, uh, is a key for the coming years. And it will be an, a big opportunity for foreign investors to come and not feel alone. They will be, uh, together with them, will be European funds stemming and flowing into the Greek economy. So today, what I can say from my side is that uh, uh, as we were discussing with uh, Ambassador Christidis the other day, uh, nobody can say that uh, Greece uh, has a red uh, tape uh, uh, element. And uh, uh, what I like to say is that we have moved from what uh, it was uh, red tape uh, to red carpet. So uh, we highly welcome uh, foreign investments. We highly welcome value-added investments. Uh, we want to see a lot of uh, investment activity uh, being in Greece. And to that end, uh, we, I can say that all the ingredients are aligned and are available at the same time to ensure success of uh, scaling up the Greek economy, meaning that we have 
ample variety of uh, financial uh, instruments available. After the severe financial crisis and default of our country 10 years ago, we are now in a turnaround uh, point. We have a lot of strategic partnership inter with international counterparts. We have uh, policies that are in the pipeline and have been already implemented. Uh, we have incentives. We have a lot of accumulated experience, technocratic concepts, change of uh, mentality about entrepreneurship and especially of the young people toward entrepreneurship. A few years ago, the young people aspired a, a, a position in the civil service. Today, things are changing. Uh, we have high quality human capital. The crisis was uh, a big opportunity for the Greeks, uh, the youngsters especially, and their, their families to invest or their children uh, education. Uh, we have high quality uh, uh, research institutes. This is an untapped potential to be extroverted in the next uh, uh, years. Also, we have a very successful uh, um, investments already implemented and welcome, welcome in Greece. We have unicorns, we have sunicorns, we have successful exits. We have also the flagship investments uh, flowing into Greece. Uh, from, our, uh, from our part, uh, we have already invested in uh, uh, 14 new funds. Uh, they have under management about 900 million. Uh, during the past two, three years, uh, taking into account the COVID uh, disruptions and uh, all the uncertainties, uh, uh, we have invested already out of the 2.1 uh, billion, the 350 million approximately. However, what is uh, very important is that you cannot do all things alone. You need to have to see the broader picture and you need to have strong partnerships to multiply the effect. So in that respect, we are focusing in international partnerships uh, and uh, also continental European and international partnerships. And what we have achieved is that uh, we want to scale up uh, the Greek economy, the Greek uh, technology, uh, the, Greek, the European technological uh, companies uh, together with, uh, as I explained later on, with uh, uh, foreign partners. Uh, so we have uh, been the founding member of uh, the Scale Up Europe initiative together with uh, BPI France, KFW Capital of Germany, TESI from Finland and Fexfonden uh, from uh, Denmark, the sovereign uh, fund of funds of uh, these countries. We are working together with the European Investment Fund and we do a lot of uh, nice things that we want uh, to have a huge impact in the Greek economy. Also, uh, what uh, uh, we are proud of is that we have a very strong sovereign partnership uh, uh, investment agreements with uh, Mubaba Dalla Capital from uh, Abu Dhabi and ADQ Abu Dhabi Developmental Holding also from uh, uh, Abu Dhabi worth uh, over 4.4 billion. We are working very smoothly with them. Uh, we have invested during the two years of lockdowns and COVID in building a strong relationship with these prestigious institutions. They trust the Greek economy. We trust each other. We exchange ideas. We ex exchange views. And we are already seeing our uh, effort from both sides to take uh, uh, flesh uh, in uh, investing in uh, co-investing and investing in uh, Greek projects. Also, we are uh, in discussion with uh, Mumtalakat from uh, Bahrain and the Public Investment Fund, the very well-known uh, Saudi Arabian uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. So on top of it, and uh, having um, uh, connecting with also with today's uh, uh, event, what we do is that uh, uh, in our institutional, in the capacity of our institutional role, we organize closed events for investors, funds, uh, big uh, institutions, financial institutions in our country to make aware 
what is happening here in Greece and what can be done. One of the landmark uh, examples and uh, encourage, of course, uh, regional collaboration because, as I said, uh, collaboration is a key to multiply the effect. Tech Tour Southeast Europe, we organized for the first time uh, last year. This, uh, we have agreed with Tech Tour to organize every year here in Greece, in Athens, uh, most probably. Um, and uh, in uh, May 2023, uh, you will receive an invitation. Uh, we will uh, have a landmark uh, um, Tech Tour uh, Southeast Europe here in Greece, bringing into uh, the picture all the stakeholders for investments from startups to very big infrastructure uh, projects. So, all in all, despite the various global major disruptions, prolonged uncertainties, etc., my message is loud and clear that the prospects of the Greek economy are extremely good, and all we are highly welcoming investors to come to Greece, discuss with them, and who knows, co-invest together with them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavropoulos, very much. Um, I would, uh, we finished with the presentations of our distinguished speakers. I hope there will be some questions from uh, the audience, um, and in the meantime, as you uh, formulate your questions, I have some questions for the members uh, of uh, the panel. I will start with you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, one of the questions I had you already elaborated upon, and I'm very glad of what I heard. That is the relationship between uh, EU and China, especially after the last visit of uh, uh, President uh, Michel. Um, and um, uh, so I won't, I won't ask anything more on that. But I would like you to elaborate a bit more on this uh, flagship venture of China in this part of Europe, in southeastern Europe, which started with uh, numbers. It was 16 plus 1. It became 17 plus 1. Today, it is 14 plus 1, because the three Baltic states have uh, uh, deserted this um, initiative. Some say uh, that it has a doubtful future, this uh, initiative. How is China uh, uh, viewing uh, this initiative and how is it progressing? We would like to have two words on this from you. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> 10 years ago, I think 10, uh, ten years ago, uh, the China CEC uh, cooperation mechanism was launched uh, based on the volunteer, uh, on the principles of uh, volunteering. So, uh, uh, and this uh, cooperation platform uh, brings uh, the opportunities for the uh, CEC countries, CEE countries, uh, to enter into the Chinese market. So, uh, we think it's a normal. Maybe uh, some of them, uh, uh, it's a small number. Uh, they are not satisfied uh, with the, the, the results. Maybe they prefer to stay outside. So it's, it's okay, depend on them. But I have to say that uh, the, the intention uh, behind this actually is in a political uh, you know, uh, decision. So this is, this is uh, what we do not want to see. Uh, I think in the coming years, uh, if the, this cooperation mechanism could result in the concrete uh, you know, uh, uh, fruits for the members, so uh, its attraction definitely will be increased. Okay. And uh, by the way, I just want to say, uh, as a member of this uh, mechanism, Greece is in a strategically located country, so uh, this gives uh, a full play to its advantage in the location and uh, shipment capacity. Uh, in the year of 
2014, uh, China, Greece, uh, uh, Hungary, and Serbia jointly launched the China-Europe Land and Sea Express Route, which started from the port of Piraeus and extended northward to the uh, Hungary-Serbia Railway, uh, covering uh, nine countries in the central and middle, uh, uh, sorry, in the in the central and eastern uh, Europe, and with a population with a total population of 7.2 million. 7 point, uh, seven, uh, sorry, uh, 72 million. So uh, uh, these routes facilitate uh, the integration of the Balkan countries into Europe and also uh, uh, make an, uh, uh, maximum uh, use of the uh, advantage of Greece as a uh, logistic hub, especially uh, international Freight Center, International Freight Transportation Center. So, yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, Umberto, uh, I wanted to touch upon uh, some, uh, let's say, criticism against uh, road transports overly burdening the environment uh, with gases that enhance the greenhouse effects. Uh, tell us two words on that. I mean, how are you addressing uh, this, uh, this issue? Yeah. Thanks for giving me the floor on this. Uh, this morning when we had the debate on energy, I was biting my tongue. On one. I wanted to jump in because, uh, like in anything, we have to be practical, we have to be realistic. Uh, the IRU has come up with a global uh, green compact that we intend to reach uh, zero net emissions by, by 2050. Uh, if people were to ask me, what's your greatest lobbying feet in, in, as, as, as the RU, I, I would say, uh, uh, firstly, that in 1996, I convinced the industry that uh, sustainability equals profitability. And we signed a charter for sustainable be development back in 1996, so getting the industry to think that, that um, uh, sustainability means you're going to make money, uh, as opposed to going out of business. The two of us, I can, I can tell you that my greatest lobbying feat was convincing my wife that I should buy Ducati, but that's, that's for later. Uh, but, but in this, in this uh, trying to achieve net zero by, by 2050, there are a number of steps that have to be taken. We have five pillars uh, that we'll, we'll use to be able to achieve that. But we also have to realize that every region is different. So I have to say, depending on the region, what are your energy uh, availabilities, wh where are the quick wins, and where are the areas that will take longer. Um, we were just on a conference, um, a video conference with our North American members, and there was a Canadian transport operator with 5,000 trucks. And he said, he started by saying, I really believe in this. I believe we need to get the net zero. He said, but if I look at my 5,000 trucks and how many of them today could I could switch over of my fleet to uh, battery electric, he said 1.6%. Uh, today, they're just not, there's not the technology available for us to switch over to, to the, the larger, uh, for larger vehicles to, to battery, uh, battery electric. Uh, people believe that we love trucks. People believe we lo that we have diesel running in our veins. We use trucks uh, because it's the best tool, and we use diesel because in terms of its energetic value today, we follow the laws of physics, it's the best bang for the buck. If tomorrow you give us a drone that runs on fusion, um, um, uh, fusion power, we'll use it if it's better than a truck. We're not married to diesel, we're not married to trucks. We're using what is the best um, uh, best energy, best, best tool. But again, we have to stay realistic. If you have a 40-ton truck today uh, and you have it running on battery and electricity that would be required for that 40-ton truck, you could actually provide electricity to 144 households. So let's say we switch all the trucks today to, to that energy. Where's your electrical grid to actually provide all the electricity that's needed? So it has to be step by step. It has to be smart. Um, and I think getting there will it just that we have to agree on how to get there. And each region will be different. And so we will work with each region on the five pillars and say, which of the pillars is the easiest win for you and work with all of them. So you're addressing the issue, which is um, yeah. Interesting and important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Yu, there are uh, some ports in, in uh, northern Greece which lately 
uh, have um, become very important in what concerns the plans for their, uh, let's say, upgrading, their enlargement, and so on. Um, and uh, all this is connected with the geopolitical, uh, let's say, developments of the last years. Does COSCO intend or have any plans to get involved in this kind of, uh, uh, um, let me say, uh, management or utilization uh, of, of uh, uh, other ports in Greece? Uh, at the moment, I think we don't have such kind of the intentions to make some operations in the northern parts of the of the Greece because uh, uh, parts of the uh, Piraeus is already big enough and also can be the accommodate all of the comprehensive of the service to all of our ships. And also because of the ge geography point of view, and I think the ports of Piraeus is the much, much better than the uh, north part of the of the Greece. And uh, because also from the history's uh, point of view uh, that the north parts of the Greece is not for the uh, economic ships, which is calling there, only for, for some, uh, uh, not for the liners, I think, it's, uh, mostly it's for the resources like the bulk carrier and uh, and also uh, for some uh, unliner uh, ships, which will be calling. So this is not a benefit to to uh, to uh, our shipping companies. Thank you. Well, as a citizen from. Uh, Thessalonica, I must say that I don't fully agree with you. Uh, I believe that uh, the port of Thessaloniki and now a days uh, with the plans for Kavala and Alexandropolis, northern Greece will become very, very important. It's what concerns uh, uh, um, connectivity in uh, not only uh, uh, the Balkans, but also uh, uh, the greater Black Sea area. Uh, we already see that. So Mr. Ambassador, I mean, uh, if other Chinese companies are interested in this, so what's your personal comment? Do you think there will be no any, you know, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, interference from the third parties on the basis of geopolitics? Oh, well, to tell you the truth, I don't know, but uh, uh, I would, uh, I mean, judging or considering uh, what uh, Costco did in uh, Piraeus, uh, I personally would be very glad if uh, Chinese uh, uh, management was uh, also uh, possible for some of these uh, ports in northern Greece. But, but yes, you are right, there are already some of them uh, which uh, uh, are managed uh, um, I'm just saying the utilization also of this kind of. When uh, we of talk course. about the connectivity, yes. So I think uh, all of the cooperation should based on the principles of the market, uh, the market principle, market rules. Exactly. If, if any geopolitics or political consideration involved so this will make the cooperation you know uh, uh, go into a deadline I so the, the rules this is a reason yes. why China insist mm. that uh, all of the cooperation should be you know uh, conducted in the principle of mutual respect and uh, in win-win approach. So this is very it, important, especially for the current situation. Of course, of course. And these are the rules that uh, should be maintained. I mean, uh, openness, clarity, fair competition. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is the best. And then I have a, a last question for uh, Mr. Lambropoulos. They say that uh, the petroleum of tomorrow will be data. And we saw what you are 
doing with your fund, not your bank, as you said, for promoting data and the use of technology and innovation. Uh, um, uh, and this is very important also for, uh, for connectivity. So uh, uh, um, do you have any plans for establishing or helping es the establishment of centers for the management and exploitation of data that could also favor uh, connectivity, make it uh, faster, uh, uh, cheaper? It is indeed uh, a fact that uh, the future of uh, the petroleum of the future is uh, data. Uh, Greece is already experiencing uh, a vast amount of uh, investments uh, in uh, data centers already. Uh, I name but a few, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, Amazon Web Services, Digital uh, uh, Realty, Pfizer, etc. that they want to, they, they are already implementing uh, big projects in uh, data storage and data management here in Greece. Also, there is a big ambitious uh, plan. Uh, this is uh, uh, going to be financed by uh, big multilateral uh, uh, agreements for uh, the big fiber optic cable connecting Asia from uh, Singapore uh, through Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Cyprus and Greece. Uh, so it will be a, a very fast uh, way of uh, transmitting uh, data and connecting uh, a big part of uh, the world, especially in our region, giving us a competitive advantage. Of course, there are um, value-added investments, and uh, I'm definite, I'm sure that uh, uh, um, all the panelists here have uh, experienced that um, innovation is a must in today's uh, reality, and uh, the tech aspect is uh, yeah. a big, uh, a big uh, plus uh, for all of us. Despite uh, whether we achieve the net zero by 2050 or um, whether there are uh, other uncertainties uh, in the future, technology is the big secret. The Chinese. Uh, uh, have a huge advantage uh, and huge uh, industry, uh, tech industry, uh, and big experience. Uh, so, yes, there are a lot of uh, different angles apart from the geopolitics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, are there any questions from uh, the audience? I don't see any hand raised. So. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for your contribution to this panel. I personally have learned, uh, have learned a lot. Um, and uh, thank you very much for being with us. So see you all uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 with uh, the last part of uh, this uh, forum. And thanks again for being with us the whole day today. Thank, Thank you. you. Ah, we go for a family photo. <laughs> yeah. family photo.